Welcome to the MD's Fantasy Football Show. Now for your host, Dan Mater. And welcome back! The MD's Fantasy Football Show is back. Back as always, I'm your host Dan Mater. We're bringing you the first episode of the 2019 season. I only have one question for all of you: Why isn't it August yet? Why must we wait? No, but that's okay because we have a lot to unpack in this episode. We're going to going over a lot of the acquisitions over the off season through trade, through free agency. Remember, we're going to be going over from the fantasy perspective, so I'm not going to be going over a bunch of defense alignment signings or backup offense alignment signings, and because I am waiting until June to bring out the projections and the rankings and the MD downloadable draft kit that will be available to you on the brand new website at www.mdffshow.com. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. That'll all be available to you back in June when we actually know what rosters are pretty much going to look like. You know, when it might actually mean Mean something that has to be one of my biggest biggest pet peeves about the industry right now is that everybody I mean I love that everybody wants so much fantasy football information already in March that part is nice but these experts out there or these other shows everybody feels like they have to give you their rankings or their projections now it just makes absolutely no sense we have no idea what teams are going to look like at this moment just absolutely none let's wait until after the NFL draft and we'll have some semblance of what rosters will really be like moving forward. And even then, when we get to July and August, we know there's going to be cuts, there's going to be late night signings, there's going to be injuries that are going to affect a lot of things. But at least after the draft, you have some idea of what teams are generally going to look like. So that is why I am waiting until June to release and have more accurate preseason projections for you depending on when your drafts are because I know some of you draft in June I think that's crazy to to draft that early but I know some of you do so that is what I'm going to wait for when I give you actual accurate projections and rankings uh, for all of that now we have a lot to talk about before we actually dive into the show here uh A lot of things have changed, as you can tell. I got the really cool theme music, but more so than that, more usable to you as the listener is the new website. As I mentioned it earlier, www.mdffshow.com. You can go on there. I have all the latest episodes uh, on that website, so if you missed an episode, you can go go onto the website and catch the latest one, or the top 10 latest ones, I think is the way I have it set up. And then you can go on there. Right now, I have a free agent tracker set up, so if you're not sure, oh, who's signed with who? What's the contracts like? I forgot who this guy signed with. Go to there, right to there, the free agent tracker. You can look up nice and easy for you. I have the same thing with the NFL draft players. They got their scouting combine results in there as well and broken down by position. Also easy for you to go in there and be like, oh, there's a scouting combine results for this player and this player. It's also ranked in the top 400 prospects that are going to be in this draft as well. So you can also take a look at that so you know who's who and who might actually be a name you hear called during that three-day stretch. I believe it's the 25th, the 26th, and the 27th of April for the NFL draft. And I also have the updated NFL draft order for you to take a look at who's going to pick where, who has how many picks, and that will turn into an NFL draft tracker during NFL draft weekend. So you'll be able to follow along on there as well. Now, and I, of course, the biggest thing, the biggest thing I have on there right now that you really should go check out immediately is the 2018 fantasy season stats. Those are perfect. You got to go back, do your research. Where did guys finish? I have the standard, the half point, and the full point PPR scoring all on there available to you. So no matter what scoring type of league you play in, you can get an idea of where guys finished at so it can help you build towards thinking who's going to be your guys in the next draft upcoming and what to expect, what can be reasonably expected out of certain guys and maybe maybe turn or twist the perception you may have on a player in a positive or negative way, depending on how you're looking at them. It give you some idea of, like, well, maybe this guy finished better than I thought he did under these circumstances, or maybe this guy finished a little bit worse. So go back and look at that. I have the total from the season stats and all 17 weeks, so you can go back and look at individual weeks to see where guys finished as well if you need to take a look at that. All of that is available to you on the website, www.mdffshow.com. I am so excited that I was able to get all this done. 
on everything I pretty much promised you guys in that last episode back in 2018 for the Week 17 preview, I have been able to accomplish or have ready to be accomplished when the time comes. All right, I don't want to talk too long on the introduction. There are a lot of things, exciting things going on right now, but I do want to get into this episode uh We have a lot to uncover. Remember, at the end of the episode, I am going to go over what uh, the NFL draft coverage from this show is going to uh, be when I'm going to plan on having those episodes. So make sure you listen all the way to the end to find out when the next episode will be and what we'll be talking about. But... To no further ado, to no further, I know I'm so excited. I just want to get the ground running. I just want to hit, I just want to hit the pads, draft my guys, and let's just go. But we got to baby steps. We got to get there first. We got to do the preparation first. And part of the preparation is talking about where guys on their new teams, what their impacts are for not just them on those teams, but the players around them, and what some new coaching impacts might be, which will be a separate series later. I'll talk about that later as well. But all of those things affect each other when you talk about situations like this with players switching out teams. So we're going to dive into, from we're going to go from alphabetical order, from the Arizona Cardinals all the way on down to the Washington Redskins, who actually didn't really make any fantasy moves, but they would be the last, uh, normally speaking. They re-signed, that's actually, I'm glad I mentioned the Washington Redskins, because they did re-sign Adrian Peterson, which would be the only fantasy quote-unquote move that they made as far as acquiring or retaining anybody. I am not going to talk about guys who re-signed with the same teams, because I think that would be a waste of time as of right now. We already saw what their fantasy impact was with that team. I know in AP's case, it might be dictated by whether Darius Geis comes back, but most for the most part, I am not going to be talking about guys who re-sign with teams. These are the only players who are going to be on different rosters than what they were a year ago and have fantasy impact. So first up with the Arizona Cardinals, not a lot to talk about there. Uh, they signed Charles Clay earlier on. Ricky Seals-Jones is still going to be the starting tight end, so signing Charles Clay I don't think is neither here nor there as far as affecting Ricky Seals' value, although I do think having a Charles Clay type for Ricky Seals to learn from and also being able to have him as a second tight end could very well be beneficial to a guy, say, like Josh Rosen or a type like that. Uh The only move they really made of interest of note thus far, you know, we still got the draft, but thus far was the signing of Kevin White. Kevin White has raw ability. Can he stay healthy? Of course, is the question. I mean, I don't think this guy's made it through more than four games in a season thus far. So could he go to Arizona and stay healthy? The reason why he's so interesting in Arizona is because I think there's a legitimate stance that he could start in a Cliffsbury offensive system on the outside because that receiving core outside of Larry Fitzgerald is very weak. I'm not a Christian Kirk fan. I'm not very impressed by him. I think he won't be that valuable until he's allowed to play the slot full time, which will not happen until Larry Fitzgerald is no longer on the field. So until that happens, I think Christian Kirk's lim- value is very limited and I don't think they have a true wide receiver outside of that right now. So Kevin White could actually find himself at least competing for a chance to play. If he could stay healthy, I believe he still has that tall, raw speed talent that he could utilize if he's able to get out there. Atlanta, Atlanta, the only thing they did that may affect their team in a fantasy capacity was sign James Carpenter and Jamon Brown. Uh, two guards that I personally have graded as sub-average type guards, especially in the rushing, rush block ability. Uh, James Carpenter does get to be of average, maybe a little bit slightly above average in the pass blocking grade that I have for him. But all in all, this does not really change the woes that the Atlanta Falcons had on the offensive line. Now, coaching might, but I want to save that. Uh, and what I'm talking about when I want to save that is that in, in June, I plan on having a coach series podcast where I'm going to break down all the different coaching changes, who those coaches are, what backgrounds they have, what production we've possibly have seen from them in the past if they've been in the NFL before, and what we could expect as a result with their general philosophy. So I'm going to have a series of that, all the different coaching changes that went on. I'm going to do a podcast for all of those. Uh, I don't think I don't know if it'll be one podcast yet. It probably will be broken down into several. But you have that to look forward to as well. In June, you'll have a good grasp on what to expect out of these coaches and what kind of systems they will be calling for these players. All right. So back to the free agency market. Now, 
I know I wasn't going to talk about defensive players, and I'm really not here, but we have to mention Earl Thomas on the Baltimore Ravens. That is an improvement. At first, I thought that they are cutting Eric Weddle was just bona fide stupid uh, in in more ways than one. He was only making $6 million. He showed last year that he still has plenty in the tank. He's not a guy who is slowing down rapidly in his career. And you were losing C.J. Mosley because you didn't want to pay him a ton of money, which I can understand, but that's still going to be a big loss on the defense. And you were losing Terrell Suggs. It just made no sense until they went out and were able to bag Earl Thomas. Now, I still think they're going to have some issues there, replacing the inside linebacker, uh, making sure they have a consistent pass rush. I think it's something they're still going to have to address, address whether it's the rest of free agency or the draft. But that the reason why I'm talking about them from a fantasy perspective is because this was the number one fantasy defense last year. And still, most leagues pl- play with a defense slash special teams. This was a defense that you wanted to draft. So with Earl Thomas, he, I think he single-handedly can keep the rest of that defense in the top top five with a caveat of Brandon Williams staying healthy because he did stay healthy last year and that went a long way in the Ravens being a top defense. If he can stay healthy two years in a row, which is what it would take at this point, Earl Thomas would be enough, I think, to keep them in the top five of defenses in fantasy football. So that is why I'm mentioning Earl Thomas there. Just something to keep in mind. We still have to wait to see how they address the inside linebacker position and the pass rushing situation. As far as other signings go on the offensive side of the ball, Mark Ingram. We do have some things we need to talk about here with Mark Ingram. Before we get into the phase perspective of it, I want to say that them, them signing Mark Ingram was bullshit. It was dumb. It was retarded. It was ridiculous. There was no reason for them to sign Mark Ingram here. I don't. You want to say Mark Ingram is an improvement over Gus Edwards? Oh, maybe catching the ball, he's a little bit of a more talented pass catcher. I also want to point out, it took Mark Ingram how many years in his career to be a competent pass catcher, where Gus Edwards was a rookie last season, and to me, a very, very, very similar player to Mark Ingram to begin with. Okay? That is what we're talking about there. I mean, it was just absolutely ridiculous to me that you would pay Mark Ingram $5 million a year when you're a Ravens team who's been going through young running backs, left and right, talented ones at that, and you had Gus Edwards, who you weren't paying anything to because he was a later round pick who showed last year that he belongs in the league and plays in the same type of role that you're going to have Mark Ingram playing in. It's not an improvement. It's not going to be an improvement in production at the end of the day. Uh, You would have been better off if you wanted to get a running back who's better at catching the ball, actually getting a compliment running back who catches the ball. Stop throwing Buck Allen out there. Stop throwing Kenneth Dixon who gets hurt every other play out there. Mark Ingram is not that answer, so I don't know what they're thinking here. And now you're going to make Gus Edwards, who had a hell of a rookie year, well, hell of a second half to his rookie year when he got to start. Now you're going to have him be the bona fide backup, getting paid nothing. This guy is a true talent. It was an absolute mistake, in my opinion, for them to sign Mark Ingram. However, having said all that, that was just my side piece as far as an NFL perspective goes. We're talking fantasy football here. So with fantasy football, Mark Ingram is in line to be a borderline first round guy on a lot of people's draft boards and for good reason. Now, he'll probably be second round on mine. But the production is going to be there, especially, especially if you are in a standard league and you don't have to worry about getting those extra points for reception because he's still not going to catch the ball a ton uh, when he goes to Baltimore. That much is clear. But he will be a featured runner, if nothing else, and they will use him in the goal line, which is something they didn't do for Gus Edwards. Look, Mark Ingram had 138 carries for 645 yards and six touchdowns in 12 games, playing half the time with Alvin Kamara and the Saints. So now if you put that over, look at Gus Edwards, okay? Gus Edwards came in, he started week 11, the same week Lamar Jackson started, and went from there until the rest of the season. From week 11 on, he averaged 17 carries a game, about 93 yards a game. So that's, he averaged over 5 yards a carry. Over a 16-game period, it would have been 278 carries, over 1,400 yards. Now, here's the difference where Mark Ingram will probably have an improvement in production, although I think it's more because of the Ravens' usage of Gus Edwards and how they'll probably use Mark Ingram than it has anything to do with an indictment on Gus Edwards. But he didn't score a lot. He only had two touchdowns over from week 11 to week 17. A lot of that had to do with Lamar Jackson running the football in. They kept using 
Buck Allen for God knows what stupid reason uh, at the goal line position. So he would run some in. They kept trying to sprinkle in Kenneth Dixon here and there whenever John Harbaugh felt the wind blow under his panties. Like, that is exactly what they did. So they will probably will not do that with Mark Ingram. Mark Ingram will get all of those touches I would suspect over a 16-game season with those amount of touches with the Baltimore Ravens, Mark Ingram should be in the double-digit touchdown range next year, without a doubt. With the amount that they're probably going to run the ball with Lamar, building this offense around that with Greg Roman, who we all know loves to run the football all the time, that is exactly what we're going to expect to see. Mark Ingram is going to be a hot commodity in redraft leagues this upcoming season. Like I said, I would not be shocked if people were willing to take him in the first round. And I... To be honest, for me, it's hard for me to admit this because I've never been a huge Mark Ingram fan, but it would I would not knock you for putting Mark Ingram up there. There would be good reason to suggest him there. I will personally, I can tell you, even without having my projections in front of me, we'll have him ranked in the second round at the highest because it's still a guy who's not going to catch the ball a ton. The Ravens aren't going to throw him the ball even though he's a quote-unquote better pass catcher than Gus Edwards. That's, that's still not something he's going to be doing a plethora of. But the rushing should be there. I think he is a candidate to have over 1,400 yards. I do think that's a mark that he can get to with the Ravens. I think he can get the 300 carries as long as he's able to stay healthy with the way they're probably going to run the football and utilize him and get him dealt to the touchdowns. That would be enough to put him in the top 10 in any format, whether it's standard, PPR, or or half-point PPR, even without the receptions against those other running backs. But he will get brought down a little bit because he's not as all-around as a lot of those first-round running backs are nowadays. For the Buffalo Bills, nothing crazy here. First, we have to laugh our asses off about the fact that they signed Frank Gore. I don't know why teams keep giving him a chance. I don't know why he's still in the... I mean... Objectively speaking, he did wind up having a semi-successful year with the Miami Dolphins this past season, so I can't really overlook that. However, having said that, your running backs already consist of LaShawn McCoy, of Chris Ivory. You add Frank Gore that mix, you need a walker for your running back position. I think combined they're over 95 years old or something to that extent between the three of them. It's absolutely ridiculous in today's NFL. And what are you going to do? Look, LaShawn McCoy, from a fantasy perspective, was already killing people, not just because the Buffalo Bills offense was absolutely atrocious last season and therefore couldn't get him the ball consistently in scoring positions, but the fact that when you did get him in the goal line and you did get him in scoring positions, you handed it off to somebody else for no reason. Explain this to me. It's like the Kenyon Drake effect that was going on up in, down in Miami is going to be going on up in Buffalo now. Look, Frank Gore didn't touch that many goal line carries in Miami, but I guarantee you that with the way the Bills have shown in the past, they do not like to use McCoy in the goal line for whatever reason. For whatever reason. It makes no sense to me, but for whatever reason, I could definitely see them using Frank Gore. I would suspect Chris Ivory will be cut before the season starts, so I don't expect him to be on the roster. At least I would really surely hope not. Hopefully Chris Ivory's cuts because they drafted somebody because somebody under 30 has to play that backfield at some point next season but from a fantasy football perspective look there's nothing to worry about with Frank Gore uh Lashawn McCoy was already going to be plopping down because that Bills we saw what happened last year he was taking consistently in the third round he was a flop there because the Bills offense was just that bad yes I know Josh Allen took over but even when Josh Allen took over and was running as much as he was uh, in that second half of this season when he came back off of injury Lashawn McCoy was still not overly effective because that offensive line is terrible and by by the way, didn't really get much better. Yes, I know everybody's making a big deal of signing Mitch Morse, but Mitch Morse grades out to be more of a pass protector, much more of a pass protector than a good run blocker. So he may keep Josh Allen upright for the whole whopping 10 times they actually decide to throw the ball that game. whoop de fucking diddle do. That does not matter with what it is that they need to be. They need to be a run first team that gets physical up in Buffalo. You are not a team that's going to throw the ball a ton. Mitch Morse to me was a signing that didn't really make a ton of sense for them and doesn't upgrade or help the Shady McCoy situation or if you so, God help me, wanted it to be the Frank Gore situation. 
either. Now, an interesting move they did make, they signed Tyler Croft. He'll probably come in, be the starting pass-catching tight end, replacing Charles Clay. He's been competent in years past. He could be that guy who, may, oh, after I do my projections, I'll have a better idea, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was in that borderline teetering, you know, top 12 tight end type of situation. He's, he's shown he's been competent in the past. I think the Bills really could benefit with Josh Allen having a tight end that he could trust and go to. So Tyler Croft may have some interesting value uh, as we get closer and we get the numbers and we get we get more we get more accurate numbers here as we move forward, knowing what the rosters are going to be, what the schedule is going to be, and so forth. Now here's the two signings with the Bills that we really have to talk about that actually have some fantasy implications. John Brown and Cole Beasley. Now look, Josh Allen can't hit the broad side of a barn, but he can throw it a mile. So the thought process here is that maybe one out of three, one out of four times, if John Brown keeps running deep, he might actually be able to hit him on one and connect. Okay, that might happen from time to time. But Josh Allen would benefit much more from a taller target wide receiver. Now, I know Kelvin Benjamin got hurt. We didn't get to see it too much. And Kelvin Benjamin, from, from what I can see at this point, may be too much of a head case. I'm not even sure at this point anymore. But with that going on, I do think that John Brown's not going to have much fantasy value. And nor do I think he really propels Josh Allen's fantasy value all that much. He already had a deep threat in Robert Foster last year, who's still going to be on the team, by the way. And it was good enough to pop a big play every so often, every few weeks or so. But it's not going to be any different with John Brown doing it than Robert Foster doing it. All right, they're both explosive. John Brown might be a more polished receiver, but he's not going to be asked to run the route tree in Buffalo. So it's not going to, him being a more polished receiver than Robert Foster isn't going to matter because his own role is only going to be going down the field and I don't think it really matters look last year John Brown had 42 catches 715 yards five touchdowns most of that production came in the first few weeks when Joe Flacco was the quarterback and the Ravens were actually throwing the ball on a consistent basis they're pretty similar in the amount of times that Buffalo passed the ball to Baltimore look Allen over a 16 game period would have thrown 426 times that's 155 times less than the Joe Flacco Lamar Jackson combination. So this would have been over the season. Flacco averaged 42 pass attempts when he was playing, while Josh Allen averaged 26. So already John Brown when he got most of his production is going to have about half the amount of times, half the amount of opportunity that the ball is even going to be in the air, period, let alone heading his direction. I don't see how John Brown catches any more than 40 balls this upcoming season, so he's not going to be a big impact. And the same thing then goes for Cole Beasley. Cole Beasley, I think, is even in a worse situation because he's not a down-the-field threat. He's a slot receiver strictly. You have to be somewhat accurate to hit these slot receivers, especially when they're running these option routes. So the only thing I can think of is, is he going to run just, just drags and just crossing patterns over the middle? Because that's the only thing I think Josh Allen would be able to hit him on and it can, any kind of consistent basis because he's not accurate, nor does he have the anticipation to be able to hit a guy who's running an option route in the slot. So that's what you see with Cole Beasley signed there. I don't know why they signed John Brown and Cole Beasley to so much money if you were the Buffalo Bills, but I'm telling you right now, they're not going to be worth a damn in fantasy, nor do they propel Josh Allen's stats up at all. Because in order for me, in order to propel Josh Allen's stats as far as as the passing goes, you're going to need a bigger receiver with a longer wide wingspan, so that way Allen has more of a hole that he can drop it in and hope the guy can come up with a catch. I don't think these guys answer that bell. The idea that John Brown's ability to go deep is somehow going to open up the passing game and give Josh Allen a chance is ridiculous because he already had that in Robert Foster. It's not like one is super more explosive than the other at this point in their career. All right, after a message from me, we'll get back on the other side to Carolina, Chicago, Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Dallas, Denver. Wondering where the MD's fantasy football show is available? You can find the show on some of the most popular podcast medias like iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, and many more popular podcast apps. Or go to the website www.mdffshow.com for the latest episodes. 
All right, let's get back on track here. Let's try to get through these a little bit faster. You can tell it's the off season. I'm going on and on about the littlest of things. That is just how excited I am. But of course, let's get back to it here. We have a few more teams, a few more interesting things to get to, and I haven't even gotten to the big ones yet. I know, I know, we are getting there. I promise the ones you actually all have been waiting for. All right, so first up, Carolina. They signed Matt Paradis. He is probably... Second best center, not not in the league, but the second best center in free agency this year. He grades out to be a pretty all-around center. Uh, he actually will be a, an improvement on that offensive line, being that they were not able to keep Ryan Khalil healthy for the most part. So that is a a good thing for Christian McCaffrey and for Cam Newton, but that's not going to be the biggest reason why they either improve or decrease this year anyway. And then that was it. That's the only thing fantasy relevant from Carolina. For Chicago, they have a couple interesting ones. You're talking about Mike Davis coming in. I think that's pretty much an indication that Jordan Howard will be traded at some point. Because he hasn't been traded as of now, I think they might be waiting until the NFL draft day to trade him away, maybe possibly move up or dump him off for an extra pick. Remains to be seen. That will be something that we will have to keep our eyes on for when that happens, which is another reason why I don't do projections this early on, because that's a big name. Uh, for fantasy purposes, that we will have to see where he ends up. Because as Mike Davis signing pretty much shows that he will not be in Chicago. And Mike Davis himself becomes very interesting because if he does take over that Jordan Howard role. He will be the primary runner, especially on first and second downs. And it's also very interesting because it could also mean that Tariq Cohen is going to get more snaps, a few more a few more plays out of him uh, this upcoming season as well because you won't have the draft capital of the second round that you invested in Jordan Howard to kind of hold him back to want to get him playing time. So I think it'll, it'll help in that sense, and Mike Davis will be an interesting guy. I don't know if he's a guy you'll be, probably won't draft. If you do draft him, it'll be in the double-digit rounds. But he may pave the way for Tariq Cohen, especially in full-point PPR, to climb up the rankings, quite frankly. They also signed Cordell Patterson. You're not going to draft Cordell Patterson, but that's something I just kind of want to throw out there. They are putting him as a running back uh, slash receiver for Chicago. I thought that was kind of interesting on their part. I thought it was interesting they signed Cordell Patterson at all. We'll see if they use him kind of as a gadget player that the New England Patriots were using him as. I don't... And, and you know, keep in mind when a lot of when the Patriots had a lot of injuries and they had to turn to Cordell Patterson, he actually had some fantasy value. So something just to keep in mind, he will be on Chicago, but not a big deal for right now. Okay, so Cincinnati. Cincinnati has to do something to up, upgrade at the offensive line position, right? So they signed John Miller. Look, John Miller's young. He's 26 years old. Way he grades out for me is that he's about slightly above average as far as a pass protector goes at the guard position, and he's right at the right below average at the run uh, ability, at the run blocking ability. I keep messing that up. The run blocking ability. So, I mean, it's neither here nor he's a okay guard. He's not awesome. He's not terrible. And frankly, just being an okay guard is an improvement along that Cincinnati offensive line. Now it's going to take a hell of a lot more than John Miller to get that really pathetic offensive line that pretty much almost destroyed Joe Mixon last year and did destroy Andy Dalton at one point in the season in order to really improve to a point where I think it'll make a big difference. But this is a step in the right direction when you're talking about Joe Mixon, you're talking about that passing game, having more time and more more, uh, opportunities for the rushing attack as well. That was it. Cincinnati did nothing else besides that. Uh, Cleveland... Here we go. Okay. So Cleveland, obviously, we have a lot to discuss about with Cleveland. It wasn't that they signed a plethora of guys, but you all know what happened. They signed Eric Cush. No, I'm just they did sign Eric Cush, but I'm just kidding. That's that's not what you guys want to hear about. Odell Beckham. First of all, hats off to John Dorsey. You should automatically with the offseason that they've had be given the GM award of the year, hands down. You sign Kareem Hunt to one year deal who turns out only gets an eight game suspension. Was blew my mind that Kareem Hunt with that video and how bad and ugly that looked only wound up getting an eight-game suspension. I know off the field he had been saying he was doing some rehab stuff and that he'd been pretty much pleading with the league that he was going around and trying to do whatever it took to better himself and still be a part of the league. I don't know if that was something that had 
anything to do with the NFL's decision. Obviously, I mean, I wouldn't say I, it, it must have because that's the only way I think he gets eight games, especially after the Ray Rice situation. I didn't think he would be allowed to play this year, period. So I was shocked that he only got half the sentence that I was expecting. And now all of a sudden, it throws it up in smoke. Nick Chubb, Nick Chubb's going to be a borderline RB1 for those first eight games. But then what happens after that? Now look, Kareem Hunt cannot practice while he is suspended with the team. So when he does come back after that eight games, we're going to have a couple questions. What kind of shape are you in? How long is it going to take you to get in the football shape? And remember, this is a new team with a new system. Granted, Freddie Kitchens isn't uh, completely different from Andy Reid, but different enough where he's going to have to pick that up as well. Now, he'll definitely be able to study the playbook uh, while he's suspended, but still practicing and playing with the plays is different than just studying it from the playbook. So he's not going to be able to do all of that until then. I think it'll take him at least a week or two to get completely acclimated back in football shape. He'll have a limited role that first week, maybe a little bit more that second week, but then that third week. So depending on when the Browns buy is, let's say they have the buy within the first eight weeks. So let's say it's week, let's say it's week nine that he's able to come back. Week nine, probably nothing. Week ten, maybe a little bit more. By week eleven, I think it's going to be very interesting to see what the Browns have planned for Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb. Is it going to be 50-50? Is, are they going to use them like a Devontae Freeman, Tevin Coleman situation? I could see that wind up being the case, but if that is the case, you have to drop Nick Chubb down a little bit because while he's going to be great for you for more than the first half of the season, from the fantasy season, he the playoff time, the most important time of the year, if he's still healthy, you're going to see a significant drop, I think, in volume. Because I think if Kareem Hunt is where he needs to be by that third week he's back, so I'm circling week 11, week 12, if he's what he needs to be by then, I would be surprised if it wasn't a 50-50 series-by-series timeshare between Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. So something to keep in mind. As far as Kareem Hunt goes, I'm not drafting Kareem Hunt. Not in a redraft league. Uh, if you have a keeper league, maybe you would want to do it in that scenario. But in a pure redraft league, I am not going to pick up a guy who, A, can't even play at all probably within the first nine weeks because he'll probably have a bye and will probably need at least two to three weeks after that before he's anything worthy of note. Now, when he comes off the suspension or maybe a week before the suspension, I try to pick him up off of waivers. But I'm going to shout this to the rooftops all summer long. Do not draft Kareem Hunt, because even when he comes back, at best, he's getting a 50-50 timeshare split, at best. So do not draft Kareem Hunt. Wait to pick him up later on in the year. Don't make that mistake. Let somebody else make that mistake for you. Odell Beckham. Back to my original point. <laughs> I know, I get carried away, but we got to the Kareem Hunt. Odell Beckham. How great is Odell Beckham for this offense? A, it's the Freddie Kitchens offense, which is a a branch of the Bruce Arians system, which is get the ball down the field, get the ball out into the air often, early, all the time. Baker Mayfield definitely looked very comfortable and played very well within that system a year ago, and they didn't have really any vertical wide receivers of note. Antonio Callaway was Jekyll and Hyde. He can make a great play, and then he would have four bad drops or four boneheaded routes run in a row. That's pretty much what he was. Jarvis Landry proved that he is not a wide receiver one in this league, like I already knew. He's a guy who needs to play in the slot predominantly, can be a second wide receiver on the outside, but the short to intermediate routes is where he needs to live. Odell Beckham opens all that up. Not only can Beckham go ahead and do Beckham things, and not only do I think he will love playing with Baker Mayfield, because we'll get into that in a second, He's going to open everything up for Jarvis Landry, for David Njoku. All of a sudden, all the pieces fit, even for Antonio Callaway. Antonio Callaway is not going to be somebody you're going to draft in a redraft league. But at DFS, there's going to be games where Antonio Callaway is going to be an interesting pick because he's going to be left on the outside one-on-one. -on -one. You're going to be paying attention to Beckham. You're going to be paying attention to Jarvis Landry. You're going to be paying attention to David Njoku. The guy who gets left out on a one-on-one -on -one matchup is Antonio Callaway. And he does have talent if he can get the mental aspect of his game together. And he has the speed, if nothing else, to get open down the field. And in that offense, with the way they use the vertical attacks, that's going to be there. So for DFS, Tony Callaway is going to have some interesting games. 
And like I said, I'm not going to take him in redraft leagues because unless the Browns completely turn to the Pittsburgh Steelers where they throw the ball almost 650 times for the season, I don't think there's going to be enough balls for even guys like Antonio Callaway to be consistent, usable pieces uh, on your fantasy team. But Beckham, he opens everything. Not only is Beckham going to perform just as well as he did with the Giants, and I would say probably better because he's in a better system that fits what he likes to do best, which is get deep, use his receiver tree. He has a quarterback who can actually throw the ball past 20 yards with any kind of velocity and zip and accuracy on it whatsoever. Yes, I'm talking to you, Eli Manning, Mr. Well, actually, it wasn't even Eli's fault. It's really David Gettleman who I'm so amped at because it's like, dude, really? It's a, it's a crock that Eli's falling off his game? Have you watched football? Have you watched football at all. Eli Manning cannot throw the ball past 20 yards with any kind of real zip or velocity whatsoever. And all we ever talked about last year was the fact that Odell Beckham was getting held back because of the limitations of Eli Manning. And as far as the people saying, well, oh, how's he going to treat Baker? What's the attitude that he's going to have? He's going to love playing with Baker Mayfield. They're both little pistols. Sometimes pistols get along with each other. And they're definitely along with each other because the only thing that those guys do is eat, breathe, live football, and want to win. That is what they do. He's going to love playing with Baker. Not to mention, oh, he's always got to be the alpha dog. There's Jarvis Landry. There's only one football. He's best friends with Jarvis Landry. They went to LSU together. I, don't, I feel like some people have forgotten that. Because the way they talk about Odell Beckham is if he's going to come in there and demand the ball 24-7 and not allow anybody to else get to get the ball or he's going to get pissed off like he's going to pull a T.O. A, he was never like that in New York, first and foremost. He never demanded the ball before anybody else. That wasn't what he did. So I don't know where that's coming from in the first place. But B, even if that was the case, the one guy he would be fine with is Jarvis Landry, who's his best friend. So I don't think that's going to be an issue. Odell Beckham is going to have a fantastic season. Will I have him ranked number one? I don't know yet. Probably not. I was more thinking along the lines that I will probably have DeAndre Hopkins as my number one wide receiver. But after I get a look at it, it may be Odell Beckham. He's going to be right there. I'm te- he's going to be the top three. It's going to be Hopkins, Beckham, and Julio as my top three. I can tell you that. Absolutely ridiculous. Any concerns you have for Odell Beckham? The Cleveland Browns offense is going to be as close to what we saw in Kansas City a year ago, where you could pretty much own the entire offense and have a really good fantasy team. And we'll get in. But that's, I mean, and that goes for Baker. Baker is going to have really good numbers. Now, he, he's a guy who I don't, I don't want to put too many things out there until I actually crunch my numbers and see where I'm really going to have him projected at. But Baker Mayfield definitely gets a boost a boost up. So that that much is for certain. All right, so let's move on here. Dallas, Randall Cobb. I mean, look, I, I think he's more talented than Cole Beasley, but he doesn't stay on the field more. The Cowboys don't really throw the ball a ton. I still think that outside of Amari Cooper, there isn't going to be another Dallas Cowboy pass catcher. That includes Jason Witten coming out of retirement, who's going to be worth owning on a consistent basis. Maybe DFS sprinkled in here. I think Michael Gallup, if he can make a jump from year one to year two, I think Randall Cobb may help with that. But can Cobb stay healthy? I mean, that's the biggest thing. If he's able to come in and stay healthy and play the slot, I think he mixes well with the with the weapons that they do have in place. But it's not an offense that typically spreads you out out that often they're going to run the ball the offense is still going to run through Zeke first Amari Cooper second so I don't know how much Randall Cobb really helps hurts his stock or anybody else's going from Dallas to Green Bay I will his stock actually I should his stock definitely gets hurt because at least if he was healthy in Green Bay you know they're going to throw the ball a ton he may have a chance to get catch balls from Aaron Rodgers so his stock definitely goes down to where you shouldn't even be drafting Randall Cobb at all in my opinion in a redraft league but he doesn't really negatively or positively affect anybody else around him for the Green Bay Packers they signed Billy Turner he's a sub average offensive guard so they didn't really help Aaron Rodgers there I don't know what the thought process was they bring back Mercedes Lewis they brought back Jimmy Graham so they're going to be the same there uh that's it. I really thought the Packers were going to sign a wide receiver. They did not. We'll see if they adjust it in the draft. Well, I mean, they brought back Geronimo Allison, I guess you could say. Uh, but it's going to be really interesting to see with them and Matt LaFour if that offense even looks any different uh, from from a year ago. The Colts, they made one move, and that one move is a very, very interesting move. Devin Funches to the Colts, I think, was brilliant 
for them. Now, look, I'm a big fan of Deion Kane, who was the rookie who got hurt in preseason, blew out his ACL, wasn't able to ever get onto the field, but he's still on the roster. I think he's still a guy who can come in and make an impact. You've got to see where he is on his injury, of course, first, but he's definitely a guy who I like a lot. But I like him a lot for the reasons that they signed Devin Funches and why he'll probably have to get put on the back burner for at least another season. Because they only signed Devin Funches to a one-year deal, so it may only be for this year. But Funches is a very, very good red zone threat. They need very good red zone threats. They already have T.Y. Hilton and a bunch of midget receivers all around him with Chester Rogers, and they try to keep throwing out you know, Ryan Grant and whoever whoever Joe Schmo asshole off the street a year ago to play on the other side of T.Y. Hilton. Eric Ebron had a hell of a year. He had a hell of a year because he's the only legitimate red zone threat that Andrew Luck had. That was why he had a hell of a year. Devin Funch is going to come in. He's not going to be the focal point like he was in Carolina because he's a compliment wide receiver. He's not a number one. He's not a guy who's going to get open on double coverage. But comp- pairing him up with T.Y. Hilton is perfect because T.Y. Hilton can do all of his little T.Y. Hilton things, move him inside, keep him outside, send him deep, all his explosive plays, and Devin Funches can be the possession, red zone threat wide receiver that he's best at on an offense that is way more capable than where he's coming from in Carolina and a much better quarterback in Andrew Luck. All right, I love Cam Newton, but when it comes to actually throwing the football, Andrew Luck is light years ahead of Cam Newton, especially at this point with Cam's shoulder being such a problem. I really like Devin Funches. I think he is a guy you're going to need to draft next year. I think he's going to be a a top sleeper candidate at the wide receiver position, regardless of what scoring system you are in. Okay, moving on here, we have Detroit. Okay, Detroit. Detroit was very, very interesting to me for a couple of different reasons. uh, Because they did nothing. And they needed to do a lot of things. So you lose Golden Tate, you replace him now with Danny Amendola. Who's going to play what? Four games? I mean, stop signing these Patriot guys. Like, I don't really understand. Like, these Patriot coaches branch off from Belichick. Right? And they don't do anything different than what Belichick would do, except for the problem is they're not Belichick. So they don't know how to put these players in position. They don't know how to rotate these guys. They don't know how to get more out of them than what they should be able to produce. And it happens everywhere these guys go. The only person who seems to have broken from that a little bit is Bill O'Brien down in Houston. But Pat, Matt, Matt Patricia, he's on his way to being another Eric Mangini, another Romeo Cornell, another Charlie Weiss. You name him, any other New England head coach who came to be, he's on his way to being just like them. He's on his way out the door. You signed Jesse James for a four-year, six, or what was it, five-year, $25 million contract for what? For what? You're Detroit. You, you don't throw the ball to the damn tight end. And even if you did, Jesse James is only effective in the red zone. I think he proved that in Pittsburgh. That's why they brought in Vance McDonald, because he wasn't that great of a pass catcher over the middle of the field between the 20s. The red zone, he might be able to be effective, but not over the 20s. So I don't think Jesse James suddenly becomes a top 12 tight end or anything like that when they signs him. Uh, They got a Boucher. A Boucher's a good pass protector as far as the offensive guard goes. He's well below average as far as running attack goes. And then they brought back guys like Zach Zenner. Which just made no sense to me. How many of these stupid, retarded running backs are you going to have? When is Carryon Johnson going to get his fair shake? That's what I would like to know, quite frankly. On the Denver side of the ball, I usually said I said I wasn't going to talk too much about guys who resigned, but because they didn't do anything really of note, I did think it was interesting that Jeff Humerman. Uh, was brought back by Denver. I do think a tight end with Joe Flacco has always shown to have success. I know at Baltimore, they last year they had like five tight ends playing at once. So it was, you know, no one tight end could have gone. But if you actually melded those tight ends down into one, it would have been a pretty productive fantasy player. Jeff Humerman has just as much of a shot as Jake Butt coming back off of injury or whoever else. that They may be able to get that role with Joe Flacco and become that number one tight end. It's just something interesting to keep an eye on uh, for next year. All right, after this next message from me, we'll get into the Jaguars, the Chiefs, and the Rams and Chargers. Radio Public is the preferred podcast app of the MD's Fantasy Football Show. For every listen, Radio Public pays the show 25 cents each time. All of that money gets put directly back into the show to enhance your entertainment and the information you receive. Plus, it's a great free app for the listener, so it's a win-win. All right, and back to the free agency we have here. Whew, 
There's a lot of them. <laughs> we got to keep going. Uh, with the Jacksonville Jaguars signing Nick Foles. All right, here's my problem. As far as an NFL standpoint, it was stupid that they signed him to four years, $88 million. That means Nick Foles is going to be locked in no matter what to the Jackson Jaguars quarterback starting spot for at least the next two years before you might move on or might be able to move on from that contract once you realize that Nick Foles is the equivalent to Case Keenum. Because that is what he is. He's a good backup. He's a good backup to have for an insurance policy. He's not a starting quarterback. And if you go back and listen to the tapes from a year ago, I was sitting there screaming to the roof that Case Keenum was not going to do diddly squat over in Denver because he's just not that good of a quarterback. He had a great year, had a great run, but he's not actually a good starting NFL quarterback. And reality will come back to hit him again. He doesn't have a true NFL arm. And that's exactly what happened in Denver. The same thing is about to happen in Jacksonville. Look, Nick Foles has only been successful in a Eagles uniform. What happened when he went to the Rams? What happened when he went to the Chiefs? He was almost run out of the league because he did not perform at all. And I don't want to hear all of this hokey pokey nonsense about, oh, he was he didn't love the game anymore, and that's the reason why. And then all of a sudden, Doug Peterson had made him find the love for the game again, and now all of a sudden, he's all good and blah, blah, blah. Kiss my ass. He didn't love the game because because he sucked at the game. That was why he lost love for the game. He gained love for the game because Peterson gave him one more shot and then all of a sudden he had a historic playoff Super Bowl run. That is why. I give him credit for it. He fits that system well. He fits those players well. You know what they don't have in Jacksonville? They don't have Alshon Jeffrey. You know what else they don't have? They also don't have a top two offensive line in Jacksonville either. You know what they also don't have? They also don't have a top tight end in Zach Ertz. They're going to have none of those weapons. Them hiring on John DeFupio as the offensive coordinator changes absolutely nothing in my book. Doug Marone is still the head coach. Doug Marone is still going to be a guy who's going to have the most influence over the offense. It's not going to be a Minnesota situation last year where John DeFupio had autonomy over the offense, and look where that got him. I'm fired halfway through the season because he refused to run the football. You're not going to do that in Jacksonville. Not with Doug Marone as the head coach. He's a run-first type of guy. So is Tom Coughlin who's calling the shots up top. So he's not going to be putting out the Eagle offense like everybody thinks he's going to be. And even if he did, they don't have any weapons. <coughs> Who knows what Marquise Lee's going to be when he comes back, but even when he comes back, he was still an average, above average wide receiver, and he was a compliment guy. D.D. Westbrook is a great playmaker, but he's not a guy who they're going to consistently utilize out in the slot, or out in the perimeter, I should say. They're going to, he's a guy they're going to try to use in the slot more, but if they're smart, they're going to be a run-first team. The only way this offense is competent is if Nick Foles can do play action because they, had, they were a run-first team with Leonard Fournette. That is the only way that they even possibly would be competent. And if you want some numbers to help with your fantasy perspective on Nick Foles, not that I think, even though he's been a hot name to talk about, it's mostly been for NFL reasons. I don't think too many fantasy people are looking at Nick Foles like, oh yeah, let me draft him next year in my redraft league. But just to give you an idea, he threw for 195 times, 141 completions, 1,400 yards, 7 touchdowns, 4 interceptions with the Eagles a season ago. His average was 39 pass attempts, 28 completions, 282 yards, 1.4 touchdowns, 0.8 interceptions. That relatively, like, and it was five games, so it's a small sample size, and we seasons don't go calculate like this. I know this, but just to give you an idea of what he was doing, of what, of how he would stack up to other quarterbacks in fantasy football. Over a 16-game period, that would have equaled out to 624 pass attempts, which would have been second only to Ben Roethlisberger last year. 451 completions, 4,500 yards, 22 touchdowns, 12 interceptions. He would have been right about where Eli Manning was as far as fantasy football goes a season ago, which would have been 18th at the quarterback, at the quarterback position for fantasy football. That's where Nick Foles would have been, and he would have had to do it on having thrown the second most times in the NFL in order to even get to that level. That's how many opportunities he would have needed. He wasn't good last year, guys. He wasn't. He wasn't good when he came in for the Eagles for the first two games. He had one good game at the end of the year, and that was it. He wasn't good last year. He's 30 years old. To give you an idea, the Jacksonville quarterbacks, Blake Bortles and Cody Kessler, combined through for 534 times, 
So 90 less times, 328 completions, 3,400 yards, 15 touchdowns, 13 interceptions. Look, Jacksonville's not going to throw the ball 624 times. I'm going to tell you that right now. Will they throw it more than 534 times? I don't think so. Maybe like five to 10 more attempts if they are going to throw it more, but it ain't going to be much more, and I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't more. So what's Nick Foles really going to do then on 90 less attempts, 90 less opportunities to throw the football? I actually did a little more digging, just to, just to get an idea. So if he had an, an average, if, if you take his averages from what would have been a 16-game season with the Eagles a year ago, and you applied it to the amount of times that Jacksonville attempted to throw the football, Nick Foles would actually have been the 23rd fantasy quarterback a season ago. So just just to give you an idea of Nick Foles does not it well if you were thinking about him being a redraft guy he's not but also he doesn't boost the 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 value of anybody else around him. Not to mention he don't have that many receivers anyway. So it's still going to be Leonard Fournette behind a bum ass offensive line. What can you do? That's the only Jacksonville fantasy thing that you're really gonna have to think of. All right, with Kansas City. Sign Carlos Hyde. Spencer Ware is right now all in the open market. He's not technically on the roster. He's not technically on anybody's roster as of now. I do think Carlos Hyde is a better running back than Spencer Ware. I do. I think he got put into a tough situation where he had to get traded to different teams a season ago. Uh, he was, you know, he was on Cleveland when they were running a different system. It wasn't as open. The offensive line wasn't playing as well under Hugh. So I think. He really ran into a lot of issues. And if you remember, even with Cleveland, because he was getting so much volume uh, rushing the football, he was actually still a solid RB2 to have. Now, this definitely affects Damian Williams. I don't know why people were getting so hyped over Damian Williams in the first place, because Damian Williams, his entire career has been nothing but a pass-catching running back. He wasn't that. Gr- he wasn't even really that great when, they, when he had the backfield completely to himself. They had to bring in Daryl Williams. Uh, he's just not a good runner to have as a consistent uh, guy back there. He's not a starter. He's not a featured back. I think everyone kind of anticipated that he would maybe split some work with Spencer Ware, but that because he was so much more explosive than Spencer Ware a season ago that he would get a chance to uh, maybe get a majority of the work. That's not going to be the case now with Carlos Hyde for sure. I don't think it would have been the case even if he had Spencer Ware there anyway. So that's that's one of the things to think about there. Like, look, Damian Williams is still going to have value in a PPR format. He's still going to be the third down guy. But he was never going to be the guy that was going to be this awesome, explosive running back that everyone was trying to make him out to be because of the run that he had towards the end of the year last year. That was never going to be the case. Everyone wants to keep bringing up this point. Well, Andy Reid, Andy Reid usually sticks with one running back. Well, guess what? He ain't going to next season because that one running back cannot be Damian Williams. Do we not remember the Dolphin days when the Dolphins tried to give Damian Williams the backfield and he just he's just not a good, consistent runner on first and second down? He's not. Carlos High will fit that role well. Carlos High will have value. He'll have more value in standard leagues, of course, but he'll have value in all leagues. He's a guy you're probably not going to take to the ninth or 10th round, and he's going to be a steal there because the, the oppor- amount of opportunities he's going to have running the ball on first and second down, being in scoring position, getting red zone uh, carries, which he will get with the Kansas City Chiefs offense, he's going to have a very good opportunity to be a weekly start flex play that you're going to get probably in the ninth, 10th round in a 12 and a 10 and 12 team league. So that's something I think he's really going to be valuable on. Somebody you're going to want to, you know, circle right now to keep your eye on as somebody later on the rounds who will have value for you as you go. Uh, just a quick mention, the Chargers signed Tyrod Taylor. I thought that was interesting to bring him in as a backup. If something were to happen to Phillip Rivers, I think Tyrod Taylor would be instantly become a number one streaming uh, quarterback. That was pretty much it for them. And the, the Rams didn't do much either. I did want to mention they got Eric Weddle. So I know a season ago we were hyping up the Rams being one of the top three defenses you should draft, and they might be a really good defense and everything like that. And sometimes it worked out well, sometimes not so much. But I do think Eric Weddle... Bringing him into that secondary with a healthier Tlaib and a healthier Marcus Peters. Still have Aaron Donald. Just signed Clay Matthews. I think that defense is well on its way to fulfilling what we thought they were going to do last year and being a top three defense. I think they're well on their way to being one again this year. So kind of like the Ravens situation where I would just circle them as a top defense that I would want to draft going into uh, next season. Okay, so we're going to take another quick break. 
right after the, right out of the break, we're going to talk about Miami, Minnesota, New England, the Saints, the Giants, and the Jets. Do you wish there was a simple, dedicated website for fantasy football information that has projections, rankings, records, and more? Well, say no more. The MD Fantasy Football website has everything I just mentioned, plus extra pieces of information like a free agent tracker, scouting combine results, and the upcoming NFL draft order. Just go to www.mdffshow.com. The man, the myth, the legend that is Ryan Fitzpatrick signing with yet another team that is going to need to use him as a stopgap quarterback. I don't know. This guy has the best, either the best luck or that Harvard degree is kicking in because he seems to just find himself in situations year after year where he can actually go on and be the starting NFL quarterback. He has no business being a starting NFL quarterback. He is a backup, but he keeps finding himself in those situations where he will keep just getting those opportunities and it's not going to stop. Look, last year, 246 times, 164 completions, over 2,300 yards, 17 touchdowns, 12 interceptions in about, I believe it was 10 games played. Uh, and he's going to get the chance. He's going to get to stay in Florida. He's just going to go a little further south. He's going to play for an ex-Patriots head coach. And we're going to see what happens. They brought back Devontae Parker. They still have Kenyon Drake, who is very talented. And now they don't have the moron that is Adam Gase. Maybe Kenyon Drake will actually be able to touch the ball on a more consistent basis. So, you know, we'll see what happens. I, Ryan Fitzpatrick, to me, is going to have no more value than a, a, a sneaky DFS play in any given week. I don't think he's going to come out. Remember, Tampa Bay had crazy amount of weapons everywhere, and plus they're running a a vertic- a very vertical, almost air raid type system. They're not going to be running that system in Miami, so he's not going to have to throw the ball down the field as much with as much reckless abandon as he did with Tampa Bay. They should have somewhat of a running game, so I don't think Ryan Fitzpatrick is going to be a guy who you're going to pick up Week one, week two. If you're gonna if you're gonna go into the season streaming quarterbacks, that's your mind thought. It's your mind process. I don't think Ryan Fitzpatrick is gonna be the guy that is suddenly gonna find that magical run like he did a season ago. I know, I know. He's done it before. Who knows? But logic would tell you that it will probably not happen again. Minnesota made one move, Amir Abdullah. The only reason I'm even bringing up Amir Abdullah is because I do think that if their defense is able to improve over the underachievement that they did a year ago, Amir Abdullah is a very good kick returner. That is a defense slash special teams that I would be interested in drafting, uh, as possibly getting me some defensive touchdowns and even special teams touchdowns as well. So I just wanted to mention them very quickly. The Patriots, nobody really of super note, but interesting that they signed Bruce Ellington, Maurice Harris, and brought back Philip Dorsett. So clearly they're going to have a a lot of competition at the same wide receiver spot, which is that slot to second outside perimeter guy. It seems to me that the Patriots are truly hopeful that Josh Gordon will be able to come back and play this season, which I'm completely shocked by because I really thought after he got suspended this last time that that would be it, right? I mean, he was pretty much out of the league for a couple of years for the same reasons, no? Like, just because he checked himself back into rehab... I'm confused by it. I mean, I don't think any player should be knocked out for weed at this I You know, it's 2019. I don't think that's something that you should be suspended for your life for. But uh, having said that, with the precedent that the NFL has set, I was a little bit surprised that there does seem to be genuine hope on the Patriots' side that Josh Gordon will be allowed to come back and play this season. I would be shocked, but there does seem to be something to that if they are willing to tender him and going after the receivers are going after clearly they're going after guys who are slot slash second wide receiver guys not guys you're going to put as the main deep threat for Tom Brady I'm maybe Robert Kraft has something to do with that but I don't think Robert Kraft has any more weight to throw around anymore uh, at this point just saying there is an advocate group out there trying to get Robert Kraft to expand to essentially do what Adam Silver had to do to the Los Angeles Clippers owner Strickland before before this uh, to get him out of the league. I don't think that's actually going to happen, but he may not have the same pull in the league office as he used to for his solicited behavior. I just think that whole story is freaking hilarious. I just don't. I don't understand. I not think of a tangent on that, but I don't understand how a billionaire gets caught in a fucking $5 happy hour masseuse 
parlor. Like, I just, I don't understand. It's absolutely hysterical to me. But I digress, and let's get a little bit back on track here. Uh, <laughs> oh, sometimes you just got to laugh, you know? So, moving on to the Saints. The Saints is something very interesting uh, this offseason. They added Latavius Murray to replace Mark Ingram, which I thought was a phenomenal move. He fits the, the Mark, I was about to say he fits Latavius' role. Latavius fits the Mark Ingram role perfectly. He'll be able to come in, give him some tough yards on first and second down or when they want to give Kamara a break. Uh, and he's been known for being one of the best goal line backs when it comes to percentage and conversion rate out there. He is perfect for what they were looking for. He's a great replacement. I think he actually has a little more explosion than Mark Ingram does as well. I think we've all had to fall victim to watching him be behind a subpar to be nice about it type of offensive lines over the past few years, especially while he was in Minnesota. This guy used to be very explosive or at least got to at least be able to show how explosive he really was. So I think Latavius Murray is going to be a very underrated player and somebody who I would consider drafting in 10 and 12 redraft leagues in the later on rounds, especially as a handcuff to Alvin Kamara if anything were to happen to him. I do think Kamara will get a few more touches, uh, especially in the rushing department, than he did with Mark Ingram. I don't think it will be quite the 50-50 split it almost was between the two of those players. Or, or even the split where Kamara just becomes the passing down guy and Ingram gobbles up like 15 carries or so. I don't think it'll be quite to that extent. I do think Kamara is going to get a little bit more work, but they are still going to rotate their running backs. So something to keep in mind. I thought Murray was a good pickup for that. Another thing that they did was they just did it this morning uh, was Jared Cook. I think that was a phenomenal signing by them. Look, Benjamin Watson was a serviceable tight end, but you saw how missing a tight end who could actually stretch the seam was very much lacking and apparent uh, in that offense a season ago and what Drew Brees could have done if he just had a tight end with the capability to stretch the seam the way Jared Cook does with Michael Thomas having the year that he was having allow Drew Brees to have another red zone target besides Michael Thomas to be able to go to besides Alvin Kamara in the passing game. It would really, I think, open up the entire offense for the New Orleans Saints with Jared Cook. So I really think this was a very good move. Now, for Jared Cook himself, last year was probably one of the most consistent years he's had as a NFL player, as a fantasy player, and that mostly had to do with the fact that he was basically the number one target for the Oakland Raiders. Now, obviously, he's not going to be the number one target for the Saints, and we have seen him on good offenses in the past just disappear. Do the Jared Cook thing where you have all the ability and you blow up on a game early on in the season, and we don't see you again for the rest of the year. That could potentially happen. I don't think because he had a good, consistent year all the way through last year that that automatically means he will be able to be consistent again this season however he's going to be on the Saints he's going to be playing in the Dome at least nine games a year because they play Atlanta in Atlanta as well so they have the eight games and then the Atlanta games so they have nine games a year in a Dome with Drew Brees with that Saints offense an offense that typically when it does have a good pass catching tight end a la Jimmy Graham will feature that that said tight end. So I do think Jared Cook will be a top 10 uh, pick to take in redraft leagues, a tight end position, if you're playing in leagues that still have a tight end position. Uh, but I wouldn't, I don't know if he's, I just, I don't know if he's going to have to quit the consistency week in and week out, but I do think it does help Michael Thomas. I think it does help Alvin Kamara and their produ productivity in the passing game as well. So I think it's a bump up for everybody. I think for Jared Cook, he's at least in the same ballpark uh, that he was with the Oakland Raiders, if not maybe a little bit more so, but I think around the similar area where you can have another really good year. He was a top five tight end with the year that he had with the Raiders. I do think somewhere in the between the top five the top 10 uh I wish I would just be the top 10 somewhere in between the top 10 is where Jared Cook will finish again with a possibility to get back inside the top five yet again for a second year in a row never really thought I would say that about Jared Cook kind of just thought he was a guy at this point in his career he was what he was but necessity brought him out last year and now a good situation may bring him around for another second successful season we're moving on to the Giants, the team that will be forever known as a team that lost Odell Beckham for nothing. So, I mean, 
Not only did they lose Odell Beckham to the Browns, but they also traded Olivier Vernon to the Browns earlier in the year for Kevin Zietler, who is a good guard, and yes, the, the Giants do need offensive line help. He's he's definitely he's an A grade as far as a pass blocking guard goes, and he's about average as far as my rushing grade for him goes uh, amongst guards around the NFL. So that's kind of where he is as far as that goes on my grades on him. He will help improve them, yes, but his impact will not be anywhere near the impact of the Olivier Vernon that you traded away. So it was a bad trade all in all, but for fantasy purposes, for offense purposes, it does help. I guess it will help Eli a little bit, Get should have a little bit more time, at least from pressure up uh, the inside, but... You still have a problem with tackle. Both tackle positions are horrible. Solder proved that he's not that great outside of New England, or at least he's not a very good pass protector. He never really was. He was a much better run blocker than he ever was a pass protector, even when he was in New England. So the fact that they depended on him to keep Eli upside was just just never made any sense in my mind. But It'll help out a little bit. Maybe you'll give him a little bit more time to get the ball to say, I don't know, Golden Tate, who they signed to replace Odell Beckham. And I do want to rip the contract a little bit. You don't want to pay Odell Beckham and you want to free up all his cap space, but you're okay paying a 31-year-old wide receiver who looks to be on the downslope of his career, looks like he might have lost half a step there in Philadelphia. You want to pay him four years, $37 million, and you want to guarantee it. You want to guarantee $23 million out of that $37 million to a 31-year-old slot wide receiver, which you have Plenty of, by the way. You have a plethora of slot wide receivers. Sterling Shepard is a slot wide receiver. He is not a guy who's going to line up on the perimeter on a consistent basis and be successful. Neither is Russell Shepard. The only person who's a, who's a perimeter wide receiver is Cody Latimer, and Cody Latimer's not worth a damn anyway. So, and not and let's also put, in, put into perspective here, Evan Ingram also needs to operate over the middle of the field. I think the Giants completely screwed themselves, and as far as fantasy purposes go, I'm not trusting any of these guys. I am not going to be drafting Sterling Shepard. I am not going to be drafting Golden Tate. I will still draft Evan Ingram, so I take it back. I will draft, uh, and I'm just talking about the pass catchers here. I'm not talking about Saquon, obviously. Uh, but as far as the pass catchers, why do the wide receivers go? I won't draft the wide receivers. Let's put it that way. Evan Ingram, I will, because Evan Ingram is going to be the only guy over six foot tall that Eli is going to be able to go to in the red zone. So as far as tight ends go, his touchdown production will be there where he should be in the bottom half of the top 10 tight ends just for that alone. Maybe the targets left over by Beckham, maybe Evan Ingram gets more of a share of that. He did have a good run when Beckham was hurt last season, so did Sterling Shepard. Now, Sterling Shepard, I don't know anybody's going to be drafting Sterling Shepard in 10 and 12 team redraft leagues next year with Golden Tate there, because Sterling Shepard's going to be the one probably line up on the outside, because Golden Tate has proven, he proved it in Philly, that he can't line up on the outside on a consistent basis. I mean, just look what happened in Philly. They moved him into the slot. He wasn't successful at all. He had one big play in the playoffs. That was it. And that was because they had Nelson Aguilar and Jordan Matthews. They had nothing but slot receivers that they had to keep rotating. Otherwise, none of, nobody would be able to get open. Nobody would be productive. What's going to be the difference in New York? And on top of it all off, I know Eli can only throw it over the middle. But you have Sterling Shepard, who's a very, very good slot receiver, who's young. He's young. So, yeah, Shepard, fantasy value, bye bye Evan Ingram, yes, you will be okay. Saquon Barkley will be Saquon Barkley. I'm not overly concerned about him. Um, the only thing I will say is that taking away Beckham takes away their deep threat, so maybe teams won't be as afraid to inch up an extra safety into the box. But because Saquon catches the ball, because he's so explosive and he's such a dynamic runner, it's really not going to bug me at the end of the day. He's still going to be in my top three picks overall in 10 and 12 draft leagues, no matter what the scoring format is, standard half or PPR, uh, but that it was just totally blew my mind and was utterly ridiculous. But if we go to the other team in New York, or should I say New Jersey, if we go to the Jets, the Jets did a lot of interesting things. Let's obviously start off with Le'Veon Bell. It's been a year since he played. Now, 
I feel like it's been like 50-50 of, of people on Le'Veon Bell. You're either on the bandwagon of he's going to be rusty at least to start because he hasn't played any year of football, or you're in the bandwagon of, well, now he's fresh, healthy, not suspended for the first two games, will have OTAs and training camp to get in the football shape and be good to go. I don't know where you are on that. Me, personally, I'm on the bandwagon of more of he's fresh. Now, I do think there will be some rust in that first game or two just because you got to get reacclimated to the game speed uh, and seeing the holes and being able to hit the holes quickly. But Le'Veon Bell is so good that I don't think it's going to be that big of a problem. And I think the biggest thing with Le'Veon Bell is I believe him when he says he's fresh. And I'm going to put an emphasis that he's finally not suspended to start the season. So he's gonna go, he's gonna show up for OTAs because he has a new contract. He's gonna show up for training camp because he has a new contract. He's gonna practice. He's going to be in football shape come week one. So the only thing you're really worried about is that for those first week or two, does he have some trouble getting back up to snuff because it's been a year? Other than that, that's it. But the fact that he's actually playing in week one and week two and not suspended for the first two games is already improvement from what we're used to getting out of Le'Veon Bell anyway. In 14 games, he would still routinely finish as a top three back regardless of him being suspended for the first few games. So if he adds on production where he actually plays in the first couple of weeks, how is that a bad thing? Who cares? He will be in shape. He's actually going to practice and be in training camp. So that's how I feel about as far as that goes with Le'Veon Bell. Now, on the other hand, you're talking about this is the Jets, not the Steelers. It's not going to be as good of an offense. He's not going to have as many opportunities to score. Will he still be able to run as effectively? Look, that, that offensive line might might have been worse than the Giants offensive line last year. It, it It's pretty close as far as how Suckville both of those offensive lines were. But they did a couple of things to improve it that I actually like. They traded for Assembly. He's a very good guard to have on the inside, especially as a run blocker. So that was a good move that they made there. Um, they got Tom Compton. Tom Compton is not great, but he's better than what they had. So he's an improvement in that sense. And they're probably going to address offensive line in the draft and moving forward as well. I think as soon as they knew they were going to get Le'Veon Bell, the emphasis became, we got to figure out O-line. Because clearly there wasn't an emphasis on wide receiver. Because they went out, they signed Jameson Crowder, which is a nice little move. But then you also signed Josh Bellamy. You have to move Quincy and Numa out to the... It's, it's like the same damn problem. It's like it's like deja vu. You just change the uniform from blue to green. And it's still New York. And you're having the same goddamn issues. Stop signing 10 million fucking wide slot wide receivers. Stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Because you're putting yourself in the same horrible, horrible situation. Same one. Where all of a sudden, Quincy knew one now, his value drops to the floor because he's never been proven to be a good perimeter wide receiver. He was only finding success in the slot a year ago. That's going to be taken over by Jamison Crowder. Now, Josh Bellamy was never a guy that you were going to draft anyway. And he's just a guy who's going to be on the bench and he's going to back up Crowder in case Crowder gets hurt. So that's all he's going to be. With Crowder, I think he, in PPR leagues, I think he could be a wide receiver four or five on your team, a guy you can be taking later on. Maybe it might be some flex play if the offense with Adam, because remember, it's Adam Gase, who I hate, but Adam Gase does get the ball to the slot receiver with some consistency. Uh, Sam Darnold's proven that he wants to throw it over the middle of the field. That is per- his preferred location. So with those two things combined, I do think in a PPR league, Crowder could have some value as that wide receiver four or five. That guy you're taking somewhere in between that 11th and 15th round, that is somewhere where I think Crowder would be able to go standard leagues i'm probably not going to touch him because he's never going to score touchdowns at the rate that he did two years ago when he scored eight touchdowns and when he kind of blew up in the first place i don't think that's ever going to happen again regardless of what team he went to so i don't think it's a knock it necessarily against the jets although i am not a sam Darnold fan i do not think he's the savior or going to be a top 10 quarterback next year like there seems to be so much hype around him to be uh people need a colder jets on that but we'll get into more of that as the season progresses as i have my projections to go off of. All right, one last quick break, and then we're going to wrap up the podcast with the last few teams that had some fantasy moves. Do you need more places to find the MD's Fantasy Football Show podcast? Go to and try out places like Podcast Addict, Simplecast, Overcast, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, and many more to be conveniently available to you. Or just go directly to the website, www.mdffshow.com. All right, next up we have the Oakland Raiders. Yes, this team is going to be very exciting to talk about all summer long. 
not just because of the obvious in Antonio Brown trade, but because of other moves that they did. Trent Brown is a hell of a get for them. He is a true left tackle. He's a true superstar in the making. I was so angry when the 49ers traded him to the Patriots in the first place. I was like, he's about to be good, guys. He just needs some time to develop. He's about to be good. And what does he do? He goes up and blows it up in New England. I was so angry. That is a great get for the Oakland Raiders. He's going to, especially in the run game, people really underestimate how great of a run blocker he is and what he's going to be able to do for them, whoever the running back winds up being, because I think they're still waiting to see. But also, Tyrell Williams is a good compliment to have for Antonio Brown. I don't know if Tyrell Williams, I don't know if his fantasy value in it of itself is going to rise uh, going to Oakland. Uh, even though he got paid the contract, even though he will definitely be the second wide receiver where in in Los Angeles, I almost said San Diego, in Los Angeles, it seemed to go back and forth with who's going to be the starter outside of Keenan Allen. I still don't think at the end of the day, his numbers will be drastically different. I don't, because he's going to be in the role where Bartavius Bryant was in, where his job is going to be go deep, take the safety out of the box, and let the primary wide receiver, which in this case will be Antonio Brown. Last year it was, you know, who the hell knows after they traded Amari Cooper away. That 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 and let them run the underneath routes and get them going in the intermediate, the short part of the field. That's where Antonio Brown's going to live. Antonio Brown to me is going to be a top five PPR wide receiver and top five half point wide receiver. The reason I don't necessarily say he'll definitely be a top five standard wide receiver is because I do question Derek Carr's ability to throw in the red zone on a consistent basis. And also, I question how many deep balls Antonio Brown is going to get from Derek Carr. Now, maybe having Tyrell Williams and having Antonio Brown will re-embolden Derek Carr like his first couple years when he wasn't afraid to throw it down the field if he saw a guy who had man-on-man coverage. But if it's based off of the la- of last year especially, but even the year before, if, it's going- if we're going to go based off of that, Derek Carr does not throw the ball past 20 yards if he can help it. That, and that's essentially been one of his biggest problems. So I don't know how many deep balls Antonio Brown's going to get. And he got quite a few with the Steelers, with Ben Roethlisberger. And got quite a few red zone targets. And I question, I question that part. I think that has to take a dip into this year. Um, I think it has. I think his targets have to take a dip a little bit too. But at the end of the day, I do think Antonio Brown in this offense with their car can still get 100 receptions, which I think will put him with his with his ability should put him as a top five receiver in PPR and half point standard. I will let you know when I actually have my projections. I'll have a better idea at that point where I have Antonio Brown. But as a collective whole, I do think that this could put Derek Carr into streaming territory. You're not going to draft Derek Carr, but I do think there are going to be matchups, maybe a la the Kansas City Chiefs, where they're going to have to score a ton, that Derek Carr will have stream-worthy opportunity, will have DFS appeal. Now that he has Antonio Brown and Tyra Williams. they got to figure out what they're going to do at running back. they got to do something about the defense. But for fantasy purposes... I think Antonio Brown will A, be okay. He's not going to fall off a cliff. I don't think Tyron Williams goes down, but I don't think he necessarily goes up. Derek Carr, I think, would be a streaming option, and this will be an interesting team to watch. We'll see. Was last year John Gruden 90s football? Because that's what he was playing. He was playing 90s football last year. Continue, or will it evolve now that they have more threats on the outside? Like Amari, Amari Cooper wasn't a bad wide receiver, but there was something there was something else going on there. There had to be. So we'll see if they take the step uh, this season. It'll be interesting to see. On the Steelers, how do you replace Antonio Brown? Well, you have James Washington, you spend a second-round pick on, or you bring in Dante Moncrief, who I think is a very underrated wide receiver. He had to go put up with Jacksonville, and in the Colts, he had a lot of injury issues. But when he was healthy and playing for the Indianapolis Colts, and this is one of the reasons why I think Devin Funches is going to do so well for them, by the way, he was a red zone monster, and he got targeted as such. And Andrew Luck was a very good quarterback. Ben Roberts was a very good quarterback, especially throwing in the red zone. He is going to be a favorite of Ben Roethlisberger to go to outside of Juju Smith-Schuster when they get inside of the 20. I would not be surprised if Dante Moncrief gets somewhere around the 8 touchdown mark, which usually will put you as a wide receiver 3, a very high-end wide receiver 4 minimum. 
So, but there's a good chance he could be a wide receiver three or flex play for a lot of people in that offense that throws the ball a ton. If he can stay healthy, he might even be able to add the yard production to go along with the touchdowns this season. Now, staying healthy is a question, and we will see. The reason I think it's going to be Dante Moncrief and not James Washington like a lot of other people, I think James Washington is a one-trick pony. I think he's a deep threat. I think that's it. I'm not impressed with his route running. I wasn't impressed with him when he coming out of college. So when they drafted him, spending a second round on him, I thought was stupid from the get-go. He's a one-trick pony in my mind. I think he might fit well if Juju Smith-Schuster was going to play the outside a little bit more and James Washington could do that old Mike Wallace role where as the slot receiver, his job was to stretch the seam and stretch the middle of the field. I think he could succeed in that kind of a role. He will catch a bomb here or there, but because Schuster's going to primarily still play the slot because they want to make sure he's A, in his comfortable element where he's produced at an incredibly high level over the past couple of years, and B, make sure you're still getting those mismatches for him. If you don't line him up on the perimeter, it's going to be hard for defenses to double him, which is what they would try to do now that Antonio Brown's not there. So I think Simon Moncrief was a really good one. I think James, and I think he will be the guy to have over James Washington going into next season. Uh, next up, we have Seattle. Not much to talk about. I just want to mention that they did sign Upati. If Upati can stay healthy and you combine him with DJ Fluker, I think that could be one hell of a run blocking interior offensive line to have. He hasn't been able to stay healthy in a really long time. That was his biggest problem in Arizona. It was the biggest thing they kept running into. They signed him to that contract. He was a good player, and he just never stayed healthy again. If he can manage to do it in Seattle, I just want to mention that that interior offensive line really should be very good for Chris Carson and Rashad Penny paving the way. Just kind of want to mention that. I'll quickly mention that they did sign Jason Myers as their new field goal kicker who was on the Jets last year. Had a pretty good year. Will probably be able to be a kicker, I would say, in the top 10, top 5 kickers possibly with the amount of opportunity he will still get to kick field goals in Seattle. So it's a quick mention of that. Now we got San Francisco. San Francisco signed Evan Coleman to pretty much to do one thing, and that was give all fantasy football players an aneurysm, especially people like me who do projections and rankings and are trying to figure out who should get what and try to be as accurate as possible. I literally wanted to put a gun to my head as soon as the second they signed Tevin Coleman because it's like, okay, well, now what? What are you going to do? Because you just you re-signed Raheem Mostert on top of it. Now, I know Raheem Mostert can play special teams, and that's where his kind of role will be, but are you going to have four running backs on the roster? Really? Dress it, or, or should I say four running backs dressing every Sunday? Because unless someone gets cut, that's what you're on your way to do. And from all intents and purposes that I understand, they still plan on moving forward with Jared McKinnon. So that means Tevin Coleman and Jared McKinnon, what, Matt Breida goes off into the sunset? Matt Breida was pretty impressive last year. Like, Matt Breida was in the top 12 running backs last year. Even though he was hurt every single game, the guy still produced. So I don't know what the plan is there. I don't know if maybe they plan on moving on for Jared McKinnon. Maybe they maybe they know something about Jared McKinnon's injury. Maybe he's not going to be back when we all thought. Maybe it's taking him longer to heal. I do not know. I know there's two things. Tevin Coleman will be the running back to own in San Francisco, and San Francisco is a valuable system under Kyle Shanahan to own a running back. Having said all that, it's not going to be any different than Atlanta because whether it's McKinnon or Brita or both, uh, he's not going to get any more touches, I think, than he did when he was starting and Ido Smith was splitting time with him when Devontae Freeman was out a year ago. I think it's going to be that kind of similar percentage of split, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit more because Kyle Shanahan does tend to run the ball a hell of a lot more than Steve Sarkeesian clearly wanted to last year. So in that sense, he may wind up with more touches. I don't know if the percentage will be any different because it will also have more attempts. But the second thing is that why Tevin Coleman? Why? I mean, I don't know why there's no interest for him. They signed him to a, only it only was took a two year what ten million dollar deal to an eight million dollar deal. I why Tevin Coleman? I love this guy's talent. He's an explosive runner. I so badly wanted to see him go to a situation where he could be 
the man, or at least if he wasn't going to be the man, like featured like full time, at least go somewhere where he was definitely going to be the starter and somebody was going to come in and spell him. Now it's just like, who knows? Now it could be 50 50. It might not even be Tevin Coleman's week or particular week, knowing Kyle Shanahan, how he likes to rotate backs. It could be Jerick McKinnon's time to start. Could He could throw. We come week four, you say, ah, the hell with it, Matt Breida. You go, you're going to go ahead and start this week. It becomes an absolute nightmare now. So he is going to be the back to own, but I'm not drafting him in the top four rounds because you don't know who it's going to be any particular week, what the split is going to be until we know more. So just going off the top of my head right now, I don't think I'm taking Tevin Coleman in the top four rounds. After that, we'll talk and see where he winds up once my rankings and projections are set. They signed Jordan Matthews because it's fun to sign Jordan Matthews, apparently. Just just, just to do it. I don't know. But you let go of Pierre Garçon. You bring in Jordan. Like, Jordan Matthews is just a little younger version of what Pierre Garçon is now, which is slow, six foot tall, can't get open on the perimeter. So, what? W- 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 Makes no sense. Fantasy wise, doesn't help hurt, you know, anything that they had going on in the first place anyway. Tampa Bay is actually our last team because Washington didn't sign anybody who wasn't already on the team last year of note that affects fantasy purposes. So Washington's actually not on this podcast. Uh, the last team here is Tampa Bay. And really, we just have two quick mentions. I uh, will, three. They signed Cairo Santos, so that will be the field goal kicker next year. I do think Santos is a legitimately good kicker, so that could be an improvement, especially in an offense that I expect to throw the ball a ton, be in scoring position quite a bit. I think that offense will do very well, so Cairo Santos could be a nice little kicker to have. And they signed Rashad Perry- Perryman for whatever that's worth. Uh, I'm not going to put any fantasy implications one way or another on that one. The main thing is that they trade away Deshaun Jackson. And I actually, I should, I didn't talk about this when we talked about the Eagles. So I'll, I'll talk about it now. Deshaun Jackson is perfect fit for the Eagles because they needed that guy. They needed somebody who was a true perimeter explosive wide receiver on the outside to compliment Alshon Jeffrey so he cannot be double teamed anymore. Because the thing about Alshon is that he has to use his body in order to catch the ball in tight situations. He's not a guy who's going to burn by anybody. And when he gets doubled, he can be taken out of games completely. But if you line up Deshaun Jackson on the other side, that safety can no longer double him because they have to respect the deep threat that is Deshaun Jackson. Then you have Alshon Alshon Jeffrey now, who's getting one-on-one. Not to mention, you have the man, Zach Ertz, at the tight end position, getting open all over the middle of the field as well. Nelson Aguilar can do Nelson Aguilar things where he can kind of be in the slot and just be that little, like, little mixture, kind of like that little out, that little safety blanket. As far as fantasy purposes go, uh, Nelson Aguilar, I think, is going to be borderline not draftable in 10 to 12 team leagues. I don't even know it's going to be that borderline, quite frankly, when I think about it. But Deshaun is going to, he's going to have a Deshaun year. Like, I don't think this is going to make Deshaun's fantasy value necessarily go up. But I do think his presence makes Alshon's value go up. Makes Zach Ertz's value maybe go from number one to tight end number instead of being number two, depending if you had Travis Kelsey ahead of him. I think it helps Carson Wentz out a ton. So his presence, I think, helps out everybody else's fantasy value on the Eagles. His is going to stay the same. He's going to, Deshaun is Deshaun. He's going to have a few geeks where he wins you the week and he's going to have a bunch of weeks where he does nothing. So he's going to be a you know, wide receiver three flex guy that you throw in there and you're hoping for a home run that day. That's who Deshaun is going to be. But it does influence the rest of that team. On the Tampa Bay side of things, I don't think it affects too much because it had become past time for Chris Godwin to take over as the starter, bona fide starter on that outside spot. Chris Godwin is a man. He's a beast. He is going to be, oh, he's going to light it up. I'm telling you right now, Chris Godwin is going to light it up. That is a talented wide receiver to have on the opposite side of Mike Evans. We'll see what they wind up doing with the slot position uh, with Adam Humphreys gone as well. They may not even bother. It could be OJ Howard, Cameron Brait thing. I mean, Bruce Arians has used two tight ends in the past when he was with the Colts back when they had, I believe it was, it was Jack Doyle and Dwayne Allen at the time. Or maybe it was Kobe Flater. I don't know. I'm getting the white guys mixed up. But it was one of those two tight ends with Dwayne Allen when they had that year where they had very good uh, tight end play. Both tight ends were doing very kind of like what the Colts did this past year where both tight ends were fantasy relevant. He's done that before. So it could be a little more mixture of that this year. I don't, we'll, we'll see. And it would make sense because Tampa Bay is kind of fit to do that. But we know they're going to throw the ball a ton. It helps Jameis Winston out that they're going to throw the ball a ton and have Bruce Arians as the head coach. Chris Godwin's going to be the beast. And I, missing Deshaun Jackson is not going to hurt this team in any kind of capacity. Uh, 
That will pretty much wrap up this podcast. Before I go, like I promised you, the NFL Draft coverage, I'm going to do two episodes. I'm going to cover quarterbacks and tight ends two weeks from now. So Thursday or Friday, two weeks from now, I'm not sure which day, but remember, you follow me at MDFF Show on Twitter and on Facebook. I will announce which day it will be uh, upcoming within probably the next week or so, but Two weeks from now, quarterbacks and tight ends. I'm going to be going over guys who I think could have a fantasy impact this year and little nuggets for those dynasty players out there for guys that I think have a good chance, depending on their situation, to improve. And then the following week, so it'll just be one week from there, I will do running backs and wide receivers. So that's what you have to look forward to. And then after that, I will announce when that coach series will take place. And after that, baby, it's going to be July and August. It's going to be crank time. But that's going to do it for this podcast. I hope you guys all enjoy it. I'm so happy to be back here. Remember, check out the website, www.mdffshow.com. We'll have the latest episode on there. But remember, Radio Public, iTunes, Podbean, Simplecast, Spotify. We are everywhere this year. So listen to the MD's Fantasy Football Show, and I will see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to the MD's Fantasy Football Show.